When the sea is raging and waves come crashing round, when my heart is heavy and I'm swiftly going down, help me to remember however rough the sea that underneath the current your arms are holding me in your arms you cradle me and make me feel secure in your arms you're showing me your mercy will endure in your you're lifting me above the troubled sea I'll be safe because I know your arms are holding me when the storm has ceased her raging the sun will still remain so until the shadows vanish your power will sustain for it's there that i find refuge where i'll be safe from harm no storm can overtake me in the shelter of your arms in your arms you cradle me and make me feel secure in your arms you're showing me your mercy will endure in your arms you're lifting me above the troubled sea i'll be safe because i know your arms are holding me Yes, I'll be safe because I know your arms are holding me. Follow along with you. I had my mic on that whole time. I had to turn it off back here, though. Did you? Good thing. Except for during this call. Oh. I was, I was singing with uh, Allie. So. If it was a duet, sorry, Allie. First Timothy chapter 1. First Timothy chapter 1 and verse 4. This is really kind of more of the devotion. It's just. One of those things that every once in a while I like to do something that is just kind of different. And um, you don't even necessarily know where it's going to go. So it's just kind of, it's good to do that. Because sometimes we get so used to getting in the rut of we have our service, we preach, and we have an a invitation. And those are good. We want to do that because we want to give people a chance to respond to the Word of God. But there are things that come up in the Bible that you're sometimes just not really even sure what to do with and, and what it means. And, and I, this isn't necessarily one of those, but it is just kind of learning to look at the Bible in a different perspective. And that's kind of what I want you to, to, to do today, to walk away from the Bible with a different perspective. The world will, will cause the way that we look at things. It, will, it can pervert it. It can turn it. It can just sometimes not even pervert it, but just change it. And so today I want to just kind of look at a problem that often happens and, and hopefully address that for you. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 4, the Bible says this, Neither give heed 
to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions, rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. 1 Timothy 6, 3 and 4. The Bible says, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he's proud knowing nothing but doting about questions. And strifes of words whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings. 2 Timothy 2.23 But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. Titus 3.9 But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and striving about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. My message, or really devotion, this, this afternoon is entitled, Questions, Questions, and More Questions. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. I pray, Father, that you would help us to have a proper perspective on it. Lord, I pray, Lord, however you choose to use this, that, Lord, it would be to your honor and to your glory. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I once read that there are around, around... 3,300 questions in the Word of God. As a pastor, I've asked many questions myself and have been asked many questions over the years. And it becomes easy the more you read your Bible, the more that we'll listen to others, the more that we live in this society, to add to the list of questions do you ever get to the point where you feel like you know less than you did? Uh, you know, even just five, ten years ago? Yeah, exactly. You, you just, you feel like there's more questions often than there is answers. And I think more often than not, we live more in the questions than we do in the knowledge of the truth. And I've noticed that with me. Uh, just lately, and I, and I, I read... I read through these portions of scripture because I'm like, man, I just, I'm not sure about this, or I'm questioning this, or I don't understand this. And so I just looked up the word questions in the Bible, and it kind of got me on this idea of, okay, well, man, I have so many questions, so many things that I don't know. This afternoon, I'm not going to answer any complex questions, so if you came here for answers... You're wasting your time. But what I will give you is maybe a, a different perspective, a different look, uh, maybe a different way of looking at the Bible that might help sometimes when you're feeling some of that confusion or some of those, qu con those questions. And um, I want us to focus on the right premise when allowing ourselves to be inundated with more questions. More questions. Number one, the first question in the Bible, understand this about questions. The first question ever asked in the Bible changed the destiny of mankind. Genesis chapter 3 verse 1, the Bible says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? I remember... When I was in high school, I took some debate. When I was in college, we took some debate. How do you win a debate? And um, one of the first, one of the, the first rules, or the first couple rules they taught us, in the introduction of the class, were the most powerful ways to win a debate. And, and especially when, I don't know if any, how many in here ever took a debate class? Or you had to take a debate class? Okay, so there's a few of you. One of, the, one of the things that they'll do to you is they'll put you on, they pick the side of a topic. And so, and, and, and what cruel teachers like to do is pick a topic where you have a strong opinion and then put you on the other side of the topic. So that was one of the things that they, they did, and, and, um, and we had to try and defend a position we didn't believe to be right, accurate, true, and we had to be able to defend it. 
by following the rules of debate and understanding one of the best tools that you have. So they teach you that the most powerful way to win a debate, especially when you don't have the facts, is to turn their own argument back on them, to turn their own information back on them. A good defense attorney does this by changing the narrative or the focus of the case. One of the best examples of this was during the 1994 O.J. Simpson trial. During the course of the trial, Simpson attorney Johnny Cochran turned the entire nation's attention from the murder itself or the murders themselves to the evidence and witnesses. Prosecutor Marsha Clark admitted years after the case that Johnny had us so focused on mishandling, on the mishandling of the blood evidence, the glove, and problems with Mark Furman, that those overshadowed what now is the obvious conclusion by over 80% of those polled in 2008 that O.J. Simpson actually was guilty of the crime. 87% polled in California believe that he's guilty of the murders of Nicole Simpson. So how in the world did Johnny Cochran get the court to go in? And at the time, I remember I was alive during that time, and I was in Southern California. And I remember when the verdict came out, no one believed he was going to get let off of that from that trial. But that's exactly what happened. And what did he do? Well, according to Marsha Clark, he focused them on their own facts. And he punched holes in their facts. Johnny Clark, regardless of Johnny Cochran, I'm sorry, regardless of what you may think of him, was probably one of the most skilled attorneys that has ever been in our society. The guy was good. He was good. But she would say, O.J. Simpson was guilty. But we were so busy chasing shadows and plugging holes connected, uh, concocted by the defense team that we screwed up what should have been one of the easiest cases to win of my entire career, end quote. That was the words of Marsha Clark. What Satan did in the Garden of Eden, he's continued to do to the lost and the saved alike. And there are a couple of things I think will help us when considering questions, when we're looking at questions. Number one, ask yourself this when you start diving into questions in the Bible. Does this put a question mark where God has already put a period? Does this put a question mark where God has already put a period? Matthew chapter 19, verse 3 we see this used by the Pharisees. The Pharisees, they were masters. And one of the things the Pharisees did was they had an understanding of the law. But nine out of ten times when they came to Christ, they didn't come to him with a doctrinal statement. They came to him with a leading question. A question that they already believed they had an answer for. Matthew chapter 19 verse 3, they put a question mark where God already had placed a period. The Bible says the Pharisees also came to him, tempting him and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? There's a question mark there. God said no already. But Jesus is going to reiterate that. Matthew 19, 4. And the Bible says, And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read? that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no, no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away. And he said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. So the Pharisees come to him and 
and they find what they think is a loophole in the Bible or this caveat in the Bible that, aha, this means something or this is something. And they put a question mark where God has put a period. Satan has been doing this for a thousands of years now. I was going to say a thousand years, been more than that. He's got a lot of practice. And one of the things I've noticed in the way that many look at the Bible is the need to find a loophole for sin, for a way of thinking, for a direction. Satan got many to fall by questioning something that God had clearly stated already. When you find yourself questioning a solid doctrine, something that's already stated in the Bible, it's always good to examine your motive for that question. Let me give you an example. I've, I've used it, and I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and say his name, Peter Ruckman. Many of you have heard of Peter Ruckman. Peter Ruckman was very staunch. He's very, he's very um, uh, contentious. If you've ever read any of his commentaries, he has no problem calling people pigs, and if they have a different point of view or a different, he's like, they're pigs, they're heresies, they're swine, they're a devil. I mean, that's just what he does. That's his... His commentaries are full of that. My dad had an old Peter Ruckman commentary, and before I even knew who Peter Ruckman was, I was flipping through and I read his commentary. I'm like, who is this guy? And I think I was in high school at the time, and my dad grabbed me and goes, don't read that. Don't even waste your time. Um, it just, that, that's just kind of how he is. Well, he stood very solidly against divorce and remarriage and all of that for a lot of years until he did it. Then all of a sudden, his doctrine changed. And that's what happens with a lot of people, is that the questions that they ask, much like the Pharisees, they, they, they're, the questions they're asking fit what they think. And so they'll change their whole doctrinal premise to try and make a, this, this round this round circle fit in a square hole or round pegs fit in a square hole. And, um, and that's what the Pharisees were constantly doing to Christ. It's interesting because if you go in and you just examine all the questions that Jesus asked, and he asks some here. And let's just look at the, because uh, this, is, this is a great example of how Christ approaches them. Look at what he says. They say, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Now they're coming with a loaded question. They are already looking back at the law because they're shocked by his answer. They shouldn't be, but they are. They're looking at the law going where, where the Bible says that yeah, a man could, if he wasn't pleased to dwell with his wife, he could give her a writing of divorcement and the whole thing was good and they could go on. And, and so for them, they think they know the answer to this question, but look, but Jesus takes them to creation. And the Bible says, and he answered unto them, have ye not read that which, that he which made them from the beginning made them male and female and said, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife and they twain shall be one flesh. So there's one of his questions, Christ's question to them. Wherefore, they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Then they say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement to put her away? So that's what they already had in their mind, that they were going to entrap him with this with. He saith unto him, Then Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. So when Jesus Christ, nine out of ten times when he asks a question, it's a question that has an obvious answer. When they're asking a question, nine out of ten times when the Pharisees, there were a few that asked honest question. One Pharisee was Nicodemus. His question was a sincere, honest question. But the, the vast majority of them, when they asked a question, they already had an answer that they were trying to trap him with. They were trying to get him with a question. And that's not what Jesus was doing to them. His questions already were clear in the answer. 
when you and I approach the Bible with a, an idea of a loophole or an ideology, I promise you, you will always find something to back your premise every time. If you're trying to find somebody, and let me give you an example. I was dealing with a young person. This has been several years back. He was struggling with pornography. Struggling, struggling. And at first he was struggling. Then he wasn't struggling with it anymore. He had completely accepted it. But he was struggling at first because he was convicted on the sin of it. But as time went on, and, uh, and, and he had gotten, I learned a lot of lessons with this. As time went on, he got to the point where he started justifying it. And he started going through, well, you know, David looked at a woman on the top of the palace and committed sin. And yes, it's a sin, but when someone does that, it's over. You're done. There's no more you're going to be able to say. And so he starts going through some of the best men in the Bible were polygamous. Some of the best men in the Bible had concubines. And so he, would, he found a way to justify his sin. It's wrong, but when the Pharisees brought the woman caught in adultery, they said this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. The law says we need to stone her, but what do you say? Jesus points to their sin. He that is without sin, let him cast the first stone. Is it an interesting that a bunch of sinners who know they're sinners are the first ones to grab another sinner and condemn them before God? That's a dangerous position for you and I to be in. God has not made you and I judges. We are to judge righteously, but it, it, that, that's not our job is based on the scripture. So you see how they use this to their advantage. We often do the same thing when we're looking for that loophole, when we're looking for something that we can, we can find. When you find yourself questioning that solid doctrine that's stated in the Bible, be careful what your motive is. I had to learn this with the whole Bible college thing. I would go in with questions, loaded questions to the Bible, and I was looking for a specific thing to back my premise. Now, this is the crazy thing. Here I am 10 years later, a decade later, and I haven't changed my mind on it, but my whole structure of how I think has changed on it. The ultimate belief that a church produces church, pastors produce pastors, on and on and on and on and on, hasn't changed. That's the mission of the church. That's the job of the church. But the way that I, the way that I am in even asking the question, I don't go into scripture looking for it anymore. And so I tend to see other things. When Satan did, what Satan did in the Garden of Eden was continued, has continued to do, he's continued to do the lost and the saved. Many of us fall into it. Luke chapter 10, verse 25, the Bible says, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up tempting him, saying, Master, and this is a good illustration of a loophole, says, and, and, and said, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? This is excellent to do to somebody, to get them to come to their own conclusion. But look at what happens here. Verse 27, the Bible says, And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Jesus is answering, He said, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. But look at this. But he, what? Willing to justify himself. Said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Isn't that crazy? This guy asked Christ, how do, I, how do I inherit eternal life? Jesus says, well, what do you think? You tell me. The guy gives the right answer. And then when he knows what he has to do, and this is so typical of so many Christians today, 
When he knows what he has to do, he's like, yeah, but what, what is the meaning of is? <laughs> Who's my neighbor? I, I have to love my neighbor, but who is he? Let's narrow this down so I don't have to be nice to too many people. Let Christ define that. And of course, Jesus gives him the Good Samaritan, who the Good Samaritan would be probably the loosest definition possible in the mind of a Jew of a good neighbor. But what is he doing? Jesus says it. He was willing to justify himself. He was approaching not the written word of God, the standing word of God. And he was literally trying to get him to define a loophole in scripture that he could poke his head through. What's your motive? I, I have, this has helped me in just looking at the Bible. Even when I've got an angst or I'm looking for something, why am I doing this? Am I doing this for my relationship? This has been several months back. I preached about the thing, times when you study the Bible and times where you read the Bible. And that too many Christians today don't read the Bible. They study it. You think, well, aren't we supposed to study it? Not when you're approaching it with a premise. Because God can't speak to you that way. When you and I approach it with a premise, that's all we're going to see. You ever know somebody that they've just buried themselves in creation? They read the Bible, that's all they see. Now, there's a place for that, but that's not going to cause an intimate relationship with the God of heaven. And, and same thing with prophecy and same thing with uh, church doctrine. And every time somebody sees the body and, and they're focused on the church, they, they see the church and how it applies to the idea of the church. And pretty soon everything's the church. And you're like, dude, it's talking about a body. Let it go. I have nothing to do with the church. Christ has given an illustration. Let it go. What's your motive? You got this lawyer standing in front of the creator of the world. And Christ, he asks the right question. What do I do to inherit eternal life? And Christ says, what do you think? He says, I love my neighbors. He goes, yeah, do that and you'll live. He goes, oh, well, well, then who's my neighbor? Please make it not be that guy. This is how pathetic we are. And when you and I think that it doesn't affect us, go back to the Garden of Eden where, where Satan asked the very first loaded question. And he changed the destiny of every single one of us sitting in here with one question. One question. Satan will often do this with forgiveness. He'll do it with forgiveness. Sometimes continuing lingering guilt for something that you've already confessed and forsaken. A cloud hanging over your head for a bad decision in life. I had another conversation the other day about eternal security with someone. How good Satan is at convincing someone they're not quite living good enough to show fruit of salvation. Now that's slippery slope. Because you and I don't believe in a works-based faith. But how many times do we sometimes look at the lives of our children who maybe aren't going to church, maybe not serving God, and we ask a question, it's reasonable, did they really accept Christ as their Savior? Or how many times do we fall into sin, not even fall, <clears throat> we jump headlong into it, and then we end up in sin, and we're like, you know, maybe I'm not saved. This particular person brought out the church of Laodicea when him and I were talking, a devotion that he did. And he said, yeah, I kind of went through the church of Laodicea. At least I think it was Laodicea. We were talking about that. And he said, you know, they're going through. And the, the premise was kind of like, I, and, and maybe wrong on this, but I got the impression that kind of there wasn't salvation there. I'm like, that's not what he said to the church of Laodicea. He didn't turn around and say, you guys need to get saved. Now, are there people in the seven churches in Asia that did? Sure. But 
You can't have a whole group of unsaved people and it be a church. It's not a church. There has to be saved, baptized believers for it to be a church. And you know, no, nobody said they needed to get saved. First Corinthians, you've got a sin mentioned among them. Is it First Corinthians chapter 9? Where the Bible, where Paul tells him, hey, you've got sins named among you that aren't even named among the Gentiles. That a man would have his, his, his father's wife. But you know, nowhere in that. You know what's missing in that whole portion of scripture? That guy needs to get on his knees, repent, and get saved. No, as a matter of fact, if you go to the second letter, the Bible says that he repented of the work. He was restored. Satan will do a lot of things to convince you you're not saved. Yeah, you can't possibly. He'll cause questions. How can a saved person think that? Man, I wanted to kill that person that pulled in front of me. How could a saved person possibly think that? Man, I, I, I'm just so bitter at this individual. I'm so upset with this situation. Or, or you know, the, the sin that's in our nation right now just... I have a hard time feeling any empathy. How, how can a saved person be this way? And Satan will stir that up in you. Do you know the biggest period ever given to mankind in the Bible is right there. What did he say at the end of that? It is finished. It's done. There, there's no more, did I believe enough? Did I understand enough? Did I, and I, my wife and I were talking about this, and I was talking to it with that, that young man, too, and I said, you know, as soon as we start looking inward is when I, I've always doubted and struggled. For me, it's been eternal security. But every time I look at me, I struggle. Every time I look at Christ, I'm sure. One of the things I've learned, I think one of the different things of differenti to differentiate between someone who's saved and lost, is when someone can't get peace reading the Bible, that's a problem. And that's one of the things I've said. If they get peace reading the Bible, and after they read the Bible and they can say, yes, I believe that, I've done that, I've, you know, on and on and on, then you're saved. Give your, put your trust in God's word, not in you. But the other thing is, is when you ask somebody, do you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross? Yes. Do you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose from the dead for your sins? Yes. Do you see what I did there? Everything was on Jesus Christ. But if I were to ask you, did you believe enough? Well, then what happens? It's me. It's on me. Do you understand Satan will do that with an awful lot of things in your life? Another question that you and I can ask is, not only does this put a question mark where God's already put a period, but am I complicating something God's initially made simple? Am I complicating something that God has initially made simple? In 1 Timothy chapter uh, 1 and 2, or in First and Second Timothy, I'm sorry, and Titus, in our text, some of those people that Paul was warning the young pastors, Timothy and Titus, about were dealing with people that once believed the resurrection, but now through some of these questions that he warns these two men about, had changed their long-standing doctrine. Second Timothy chapter two, verse sixteen. Through 18, if you keep reading about them, he says this, but, shame, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto, the more ungod, unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenius and Philtus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. One of the things I hadn't noticed or, or attributes I hadn't noticed or paid attention to he, here, and you say, how in the world did you do that? Because we just studied that not that long ago. 
But I don't think I really addressed this when I looked at it. And it's my own question. When it says that the resurrection is already past, are they saying there's no bodily resurrection at all? Or are they questioning what Paul wrote to the church of Thessalonica, the dead in Christ shall rise first, the second coming of Christ, that it already came and went? Because there is an awful lot of people today that are falling into that kind of a theological way of thinking. It's interesting that the second coming of Christ is such a crazy, like, there's all these weird thoughts and beliefs that are around it. It may indicate here that this isn't new. But these people at one point in time had the right faith, but the Bible said they had erred from it. Not only had they erred from it, but they said, oh, the resurrection? You're talking about the resurrection? And let's just say that's what they're referring to. That's an opinion. I don't know. But it does say that the resurrection is already past. The dead in Christ shall rise first. So what are they in? Is that a post-millennial view? What, what, what are they saying? That there's a, there's a resurrection that already happened that's done? It's over? So what does that mean for the people that are left? I mean, there's so many ways. It's like, where, where were these guys going with this? The Bible doesn't tell us. It just tells us they took something as simple as the second resurrection. We see glimpses of it with Jesus as he talks to Mary and Martha, and she goes, I, I know they'll resurrect again in the last days. So what are they saying that they're in? Are they saying that they're already in a tribulation period? Are they mid-post-trib? What's the question that's being answered here? Don't know. But we do know this. The Apostle Paul says it all started with these questions that went into these profane babblings and they increased unto more ungodliness. It ate as a canker worm eats. He said concerning the truth they've erred. The resurrection's passed already. And what happens as a result? They overthrow the faith of some. What does it mean to overthrow the faith? Well, it means they had it, but they've changed it. They've changed it. Am I complicating something simple? You go, how in the world could somebody believe that the resurrection is already come and passed? I don't know. How could you be in a garden with two perfect, sinless people, and a serpent comes up and says, has God said? And I'm like, yeah, he put, a, he put a period on this. And then Satan turns it into, no, this isn't as clear as you think. No, this isn't, this, this has a deeper meaning. No, this means more. Listen, Christian, the resurrection of the dead is one of the most basic doctrines in the Bible. It's basic. The dead in Christ already rose. It came and went. Consider what we know about our Lord and His Word. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33, the Bible says this, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Romans 12, 8, the Bible says, Or he that exhorteth on exhortation that he give, let him do it with what? Simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mer mercy, showeth mercy with cheerfulness. 2 Corinthians eleven three, 3, going right back to the Garden of Eden. What does Paul tell the children, the, the church of Corinth? But I fear lest by any means, by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Are you putting question marks where God has placed periods? Why am I saying that? Well, we live in a society today that doesn't know what a man and a woman is. I mean, not, not, it, crazy. I don't know. If you've seen, 
I'm, I've just started watching that Matt Walsh thing. I haven't got through it yet. On what is a woman? Do you know who most of the people are that don't know? Professors. Professors. Professors, medical, educated people. Smart people. He has one that he goes in. This blonde guy, glasses. You can actually see a clip of this on YouTube if you want. But he keeps talking about the truth, and the guy goes, well, I'm uncomfortable with you keep saying, you keep invoking the truth. That's the society that we live in today. We can get swayed by that as well. One of the problems with Christianity today is every time the world gets worse, we just keep several steps back, but we make that adjustment as well at times we got to be careful the bible folks the bible is not a book of questions it's a book of answers and i'm 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 getting really disturbed with a lot of what i'm seeing in on youtube on preaching and some of the things is you can really get to the point where you start thinking the bible's a book of questions leaving all these holes that are impossible to fill in. And that is not what God left us at all. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, the Bible says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. You know, one of the things that will often happen to a young teenager is, especially one that grows up in a good Christian home, they start hitting those teenage years, and they start questioning everything. And if they want to go out and experience things, pretty soon they'll start feeling like, and can start feeling like, mom and dad have kept me from some things. They're keeping me from stuff. And you know, little kids are curious anyway. Every family has the informer. But every family also has the kids that they listen in on what mom and dad are saying. What are they talking about? Who are they talking about? They'll start getting curious about certain things. And you know, the thing is, everything that young people get curious about 90% of it is things you're trying to protect them from. Uh, one of the most dangerous things about the playground in a group of lost kids with a saved kid that are starting to go in those pubescent years is what they'll talk about, what they've seen. You're trying to protect your kid's eyes and ears and pretty soon they go home and it's very easy to think for them to start thinking, man, mom and dad are trying to keep stuff from me. It's all the wrong stuff. I remember when I first started working, I like a lot of Christian young people that grew up in Christian homes. I started working and kids would come into the workplace and they'd be like talking about their parties. And they'd be like, yeah, we drank all night. And, and they would always paint this picture of just, dude, we drank and we had, a, we had a blast and on and on and on and on they would go. And I had several of my friends that were in the youth department that got sucked into that thinking, man, I'm really missing out on some fun here. Until they found out, no, you ain't missing out on anything at all. And sometimes... We can get that way in the Bible, where God purposely leaves things vague. We think God's hiding stuff. Or we think we're just not getting it, or everyone else just isn't getting it. And there's all these questions, and you're kind of looking at it going, and yet then we sacrifice the things we clearly know we're supposed to be doing. I think a few years ago, it was at a men's retreat, I think it was Paul Schwenke was talking about a friend of his that gave up his church because he was going to go research why a colon was in the Bible somewhere. And he made this whole thing of this, this guy 
stopped preaching, stopped going out, stopped going so I'm, I'm amazed at how many of these YouTube philosophers and scholars, they're not out soul winning in our community. Half of them, I kind of wonder if they're even soul winning in their own. And yet, the great commission of the church, pretty simple. It's pretty easy. God put a period there. Lo, I'm with you always, even into the end of the world. And yet, there are so many of us that sit here today that we really haven't experienced what it's like to win 10, 20, 30, 40 people to the Lord. And the reason why I go 10, 20, 30, 40 is the Bible talks about some are going to bear fruit tenfold, 20, 30. And yet many of us have lived our whole life. We've, we've never experienced that. Some of you young people that you've grown up in church, your whole, you've got all these answers. You know the Bible back and forward. You know the Romans road. You know all of these things. And you're not passing out tracts. Or you're not in church the way that you ought to be. These are basics, not forsaking the assembling as the manner of some. Some have a habit of not doing it, not, not showing up, not being in church, not being involved. You know, like the, these are the basics. These are the basics of what's supposed to happen. I love something that Jordan Peterson says in, I think it's his book, but he talks about how all these millennials want to save the world. And he's like, they live in their parents' basement, and it's a pigsty. He's like, hey, before you want to clean up the whole world, maybe you ought to clean up your own room first. Just saying. And you know, some of us are kind of the same way. It's like, I love prophecy as much as the other guy. I love talking about what heaven's going to look like, but the Bible does see, say, I hath not seen or ear heard. There are things that are just perfectly purposely vague Jesus when he left this earth said you know um, I would there were more things I wanted to tell you but you can't bear them right now but there are other things that he's made very clear young person before you start giving your parents a philosophy lesson on the truths of the Bible and Jesus Christ and how they ought to be better parents maybe you ought to just be an obedient child God pretty much spells that one out. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Before you want to start correcting your mom and dad, or, or young people are especially good with their mom doing this, because mom's homeschooling, and you get the daughter that gets a little too big for her britches, or the young man that my, my oldest son, probably out of all my kids, was the one that he was really smart. And so he would correct his mom. And I'm like, do you want to homeschool everybody? No. Then shut your mouth. Do your homework. Get your stuff done. Don't worry about them. Get your own stuff done. And you know, sometimes we're just kind of like that. We, we get to the point where there's all these questions, all these inquiries, all, all this information. And it's like, hey, do what you know. God put a period. 3,000 300 questions in the Bible, and yet this book is almost exclusively a book of answers for your eternal soul. What do you see when you read the Bible? What are you looking at? The Bible says, I love the Bereans perspective. The Bible says that they studied to see if these things were so. Many of us study to see if these things are not so. It's just our perspective. It's just the critical nature of mankind. And it takes us all the way back to the Garden of Eden when God said, you got this entire place. You got every tree in this garden. But there's this one tree, and that's the very place we find the first loaded question. What's your motive when you go into the word of God. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you. We praise you for your word. Thank you for this time. And Lord, I pray that you'll just be with us as we go home. Keep us safe. God, we love you and we thank you for it. In Jesus' precious name, amen. You're dismissed.
Good job. That was a great song. I appreciate it. You've got a friend in me. You've got a friend in me.